So I'm very uh, pleased to introduce our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Angelica Lim. Um, Dr. Lim is an assistant professor of professional practice in computing scientists, sciences at uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, she studied and worked in robotics for over 10 years in Canada, France, and Japan. As director of the SSU Rosie Lab, her current research focuses on building robots with social intelligence and empathy particularly using affective and developmental robotics paradigms. Before that, she spent four years as a software engineering manager at SoftBank Robotics in Paris, where she led the emotion recognition team for Pepper, the humanoid robot. You may have all seen Pepper on the web. Um, she's been featured on the BBC, given talks at SXSW, and a TED Talk, and she's hosted a TV documentary on robots, and she was recently featured in Forbes' 20 Leading Women in AI. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce her, and the title of her talk is Building Robots with Emotional Intelligence. Uh, thank you for such a nice introduction. It's just me. <laughs> My name is Angelica. So grateful um, for you to have me here uh, at Rutgers. Um, today we're going to explore a little bit more about this world of robotics and emotions, which seem to be very um, counterintuitively linked. So maybe I can get, get a show of hands here. Who here is in computer science? Okay. Um, psychology? Anybody? Okay. Uh, philosophy? Great. Uh, who did I miss? Yep. And robotics, specifically robotics. Okay, cool. Okay, that, that gives you a, a better idea. So um, let me start by asking you a question. Uh, who here has seen the movie Her? It's from 2013, Spike Jones. Okay, so uh, if you haven't seen it, no worries. We're going to start off with a quick clip from this movie. Um, it's about an AI, an artificial intelligence named Samantha and her human, Theodore. So if you haven't already seen this movie, I strongly recommend watching it. It's quite fascinating. Here an AI named Samantha lives in the smartphone of Theodore and says some cu a couple surprising things. She says that she's composing music. And the second one is that um, what we're going to talk about today is that music is about how she feels in the sun on the beach with her friend Theodore. Um, she's able to link these sounds, these vibrations in the air, to the feelings of the physical world around her. Wow, yeah, just some AI, yeah. Um, but would you say that this music fit the scene? Or maybe her feelings about it? Yeah, and how do you know that? Or what makes you feel that way? Um, so the idea that this fits and what it takes to build an AI like Samantha, we're gonna explore this general idea today. Um, is kind of emotional intelligence. Um, and I chose Samantha because we're going to focus on emotion in voice and in sound. Uh, so today we're not going to really do a big survey of emotional emotions or in emotional intelligence because it's such a broad field, but we're going to take a deep dive. Um, we're going to ask questions like, how could robots learn like humans, a field of, called developmental robotics? And maybe even get into the idea, although maybe not the solution, of what would it mean for a robot to feel? Um, and we're going to talk about emotions, and maybe, but maybe you can apply this somehow to your research as well. So hopefully everybody here will get something out of this. Okay. 
So we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but why don't we start with a definition, a definition of intelligence, period, according to Merriam-Webster here. So um, according to this definition, intelligence is the ability to learn, understand, and deal with new or difficult situations. So we'll go through each of these things one by one today, but let's just think about this for a second. So we're here at Rutgers, we're at a university, we're all trying to increase our knowledge, trying to become in more intelligent, right? So to do that, people take courses, and at the end of each semester, they're confronted with a test. These new difficult situations, probably that they've never seen before. Now, the more different that a question is, the more they can express or show how much they understood the concept. If it's a very similar problem to one they've seen before, you say, okay, maybe they understood it, but maybe they just kind of transferred a bit of knowledge. But if they're able to attack or solve a problem that's very different from ones they've seen before, then you can say, wow, they really understood the concept. Wow, th there's some intelligence going on here. So um, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a computer scientist, but what, I'm, what I'd like to talk about today is trying to implement something, let's just say we want to implement something approximating emotion. If we wanted to do that, we need to understand how that works for humans, or at least try to hypothesize how that works for humans. Okay, so um, anybody here an emotion expert? Okay, great. So uh, let me just start off with some definitions then. Um, emotion, the, I, the definition of emotion is not necessarily very clear even among theorists. So here's just one definition. It's a synchronized reaction to an event. So say for example, somebody bumped your car, right? And it involves lots of components like a feeling, like, oh, oh bumped my car. That expression of the feeling, like shaking your fist, um, action tendency to respond to that event, get out of the car, go and see that person. Um, a psychological change like blood rushing to your cheeks and regulation, for example, to calm ourselves down. Um, there's a lot of components here, so we're gonna cover today two aspects, uh, the expressive parts and the feeling parts. Um, has anybody heard of primary or secondary emotions? Okay, so primary, it's the first kind of emotional reaction to an event. Okay, for example, let's say your friend says, oh, I have some great news. I'm moving to Barbados. I don't know where that came from. Um, your first primary emotion might be, oh, yay, that's good for you. But then your secondary emotion might be, oh, wait, when I think about what that implies, you're not going to be here with me anymore. Okay, and I'm sad. So there's a primary and secondary emotion. Uh, let's see. So there are a couple definitions there. But one question we might ask ourselves as an AI person or a machine learning person in, in emotion is this. Does anybody know here if emotion is learned? It's not necessarily very clear. In popular culture, at least, people, many people think emotion is innate or even emotional expressions are innate. Um, Paul Ekman hypothesized the six basic emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, disgust, surprise, that are cross-cultural, universal. But there are some um, growing number of psychologists, including um, Lisa Feldman Barrett, she's one of the more vocal people about this uh, in Nor at Northeastern. Um, she's, they're trying to change the, the, um, the conversation about this, and they say there's more to it. Because according to people, researchers in developmental psychology, in infant development, we know that emotions develop in the first year of life. At three months, infants express joy, sadness, disgust. Up to six months, they express anger. And lastly, they express fear. And only after they develop the idea of self do they express more complex emotions like embarrassment. And so we see these emotions develop over time. Um, and while everybody has them, like language, it may be that we need input or data to refine them. They're not always felt and expressed in the same way. Who here has lived in a country outside of the US? OK, maybe in another culture, it, maybe you've noticed that emotions are not expressed in exactly the same way. I, I see some nods. 
So Jean Tsai, so that's not Jean Tsai, she, this is just a smiling woman. She, Jean Tsai is a, a psychologist at the University at, at Stanford, and she's found that emotions differ depending on where you were raised. So people living in North America, uh, Western cultures would generally say that feeling good is something like a high arousal positive. This is feeling good is, yeah, like the, you know, Rutgers team one, whoo, kind of high arousal um, positive. Whereas in Eastern cultures like Japan or China, they'll show a significant preference for low arousal positive. So more like bliss, okay? So how can this information help us make an AI with emotional intelligence? Let's look at what this baby is doing in their first year of life. So there's a particular phenomenon that has been proposed might be at the root of it. Uh, it's called mother ease. Every culture has it, you've seen it. Mother holds a baby about 30 centimeters from their face and speaks in an emotionally exaggerated way. So the interaction so special is that when you put a mother in front of a microphone, they can't re reliably reproduce mother ease. They need the infant. So we put a robot in the position of an infant to see if mother ease could allow it to develop a similar base of emotional intelligence. Yeah, we actually we actually did that. It's kind of <laughs> kind of weird, but I was in Japan and we were doing we were like allowed to do really weird things. Anyway, so to check this, we had the robot interact with our users in four different conditions according to um, four different types of motheries according to Fernald. So according to her, there's these different kinds of speech. There's approval like, good boy, yeah, <laughs> or attention like, look look at the ball, look. Her prohibition, no no, don't touch and comfort, like, oh, it's okay, yeah, right? We collected 400 and, uh, 510 samples all in all, and we use this to train a machine learning model. Okay, I'll talk about a bit more about that later. But this is interesting because, I'll let you listen to some. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the, that was the praise, like, let's, let's play. <laughs> okay, that was uh, trying to get attention. <laughs> Which one was that? P Prohibition, yep. Okay, and comfort, okay. And what we wanted to know was, if you were to train your machine learning classifier with this, something that happens quite naturally, would now your machine learning classifier be able to recognize adult emotions? Okay, so we took a database of um, emotional expressions. They were in German. Why? Why German? Because it was free you know, research, right? <laughs> so, and they sounded like this. Does anybody speak German here? Yeah. Do you know what that said? It. It doesn't make sense. It's something like tonight there will be a thing or something. It doesn't really make sense. Sorry. Tonight I can tell them or oh yeah, yeah. Tonight I will tell them. Yeah. So it doesn't actually have any semantic meaning. They're just saying it in many different ways. But here's here's what happened. By the way, crossing. Has anybody tried crossing a data set before? You train with one data set and you test it with a completely other data set. This is really hard. This is really hard. Um, but we trained our AI with emotional baby talk, and we tested it with German emotional dynamics. And what's crazy, it didn't completely fail, which, is, which was surprising. We get rates much better than chance between happiness and praise, comfort and sadness, and attention and fear, which are very interesting. You know, maybe fear because when the kid's going for the, the light socket, you're like, oh, don't touch that, don't, you know, like that same kind of get attention um, dynamic. The exception was anger. Uh, it was confused with praise. Um, and it might be because the voice profiles are really similar, but you need to see the face. So I'll give you an example, and you have to look at my face for a second. <laughs> so like, hey, and hey. So you might actually need the face to be able to distinguish between uh, positive and negative for these high intensity um, dynamics. But could we push this idea even further? Okay, and this is where I'm gonna ask you to take out your pens. <laughs> um, bring out that piece of paper. The question will be, could we find some cross-domain generalizations? Kind of like Samantha did with 
the beach and the waves and then music. So let's do this drawing exercise. Um, I'm going to play four clips of music. And I hope this works. <laughs> um, maybe you can just note down, I'm gonna play one, two, three, four, and you just keep your pen on the paper for each one, and just, what was my, uh, draw along with the music without taking your pen off the paper, okay? So here's the first one. Are you drawing? Drawing? Okay, that's it. That's that's example. Okay, number. Yep. What were we supposed to draw? Just draw an abstract line uh, that kind of represents how you feel about the music. Okay. Number two. Number three. Okay, and number four. Okay, now compare with your partner or compare with someone next to you. Was there? Can anybody share their observations, if any? I've never actually run this actual experiment before. It's more just to, to try it. Were there any um, patterns or commonalities? Or just four. nothing that looks similar? Two and four look similar? Okay. Oh, okay. So between you, between you two, uh, number two, which was um, da, 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 I think that was that one. Yeah, lots of kind of harsh strokes or something like that. Okay, super interesting. The, the, the basis of this idea is, goes back to the Buba Kiki effect. Have, has anybody heard about the Buba Kiki effect? Um, have a look at it if you have it. I don't have an example here, but the idea is that there have been studies showing that people link particular shapes to different to particular sounds. So Buba tends to have these rounder shapes, and Kiki kind of tends to um, be associated with more spiky shapes. It seems our senses are linked. So yeah, it's long been suggested that emotions, whether it's dance, music, or voice, have the same underlying code. It seems possible, but is it true? That was the question I wanted to get at um, during some of my research in the past. So let's just take a look. So what could they have in common? Well, it seemed like these were all kind of slow not very intense, they all kind of signify sadness somehow, right? Fast, very attacked kind of motions and music and voice. So very fast and irregular. And how about this? Fast and large, kind of signifying happiness, at least in the Western context. Okay, so given this intuition, what we did at Kyoto University was uh, we investigated the features related to emotion recognition in these three different areas, voice, music, and emotion. Anybody here play music or consider themselves a musician? Okay, so we started finding similarities. For example, in voice, one of the features that is important to recognize emotion is speech rate, so how fast you're speaking. In motion, the velocity of the movement might also say something about the emotion you see. In music, that might be the tempo. All of these kind of correspond to this idea of speed. In voice, the voice onset rapidity, like the acceleration of your attack, and in music, your note attack and motion accelerations are all kind of linked under this intensity idea. In motion, phase shift, so you know, this, if this is a motion, a phase shift might be something like this. 
uh, irregularities in music like da 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 that we heard earlier and voice jitter so like the roughness or smoothness in your voice are all kind of this regularity parameter and volume spatial extent and pitch range are all this idea of extent and so we built this model um, it's called the sire model which is trying to represent emotion based on these four factors here's an example so these two happy voices are relatively fast um, with large pitch extent. So I want to just show you a little bit more about this. So these were the kinds of mappings that we had. Fast, fast and intense voices for fear. And slow and low intensity for sad, sadness voices. And then, OK, for the robotics uh, people in the room. We did this for robot gestures as well. So we looked at, let's have a look on the left-hand side here for joint speed. We tried to map these parameters between slow gestures and fast gestures. Low intensity and high intensity, high acceleration gestures. Phase offset, so going from irregular to regular. Okay and gesture size, so small gestures versus large gestures. So, OK, so we made some mappings, but how can we know if these four parameters can actually represent emotion nicely? Well, one idea was to develop a, an emotion transfer system. So here's the idea. If we extract speech uh, parameters into these four numbers, and then we use those four numbers to generate a gesture. If the same emotion is perceived on both sides from speech and gesture, that means that with just four numbers, we were able to encapsulate that <coughs> emotion. Right? Does that make sense? OK. So that's what we, we tried to do. Um, and I won't go over the details of the study, but here's kind of what they made. So we take these parameters and we use them to generate gestures. So we extract those parameters from the voice and we use them to generate a gesture. So we found some um, agreement for certain uh, values of sire. So uh, very regular, small extent, low speed ones as sadness. Um, intense, medium speed, large motions as anger. Very fast, very intense, and small um, motions as fear. And happiness as relatively large and quick. Okay, so we found some, some of these cross-modal sire values, which is kind of cool, because it, it, we don't really think of uh, emotion cross-modally like that. But So then you might ask, okay, so you found some parameters that happen to work across some modalities. But does this work in general? Like, let's say you look at many different expressions of emotion. Does that hold? I'm going to get into a little bit more of the for the computer scientists in the room. So does anybody know the Gaussian mixture model, GMM? OK, so I know everyone's doing convolutional neural networks right now. But um, a few years ago, we were still looking at GMMs. And I still think this has some interesting properties. So the idea is, let's say we take our GMM and we train it with happy voices. OK, we get this nice Gaussian mixture with uh, a distribution of happy parameters in this 4D space. What's great about the GMM is that, first of all, it represents the knowledge. So you can inspect your model, and you find out that, oh, it has two bumps on it. And when you find these two bumps and you inspect their means, you can say things um, that are quite interesting. For instance, 
we found out something quite interesting with our data for fear. So we had lots of you know, German scared voices, right? But when we analyzed it like this, we found out that, it, hey, there's actually more to it than just scared voices. There's really fast, oh, super scared kind of terror voices. And then like, oh, oh I, I'm kind of scared of what's over there. More anxiety voices. And so by looking at our data like this, we can inspect and understand that there's more, more to it than, than um, first met the eye. Our GMM was a recognizer as well, so you give it some new speech, and then it lights up um, whichever uh, model has the highest likelihood. So for example, this new speech looks like it's, most, it's, it's fear. But it also allows you to express um, emotion in a statistically pro pro probable way. So let's say we want to express happiness. Um, it might have a 25% chance to pick from that uh, Gaussian mixture over there and a very, very tiny chance to pick from where there isn't um, a Gaussian um, in the model. And so you might take that and it might generate a happy gesture that looks like this. Why am I telling you all this? Um, I think as cognitive scientists, we have to try and get at models that are general. Like we want to go for things that have the maximum amount of explainability as we can. And that's what, you know, that's kind of what science is. We're trying to build models of the world. And so if you can make a general model that can do many things, that's in some ways um, nicer than a model that might work 99% of the time, but only in a small, very specific domain. So that's kind of what I, I'm trying to get across. OK. So we, tra we actually did this cross-modal recognition. We trained our AI with emotional German voice. And then we tried to distinguish it, uh, distinguish emotional walking. So we had this body movement library of people walking happily like this, or sad like this, or angry. And we wanted to see if the robot or the AI could recognize these movements after only being trained by sound. Like Mother Reese, maybe. And it kind of worked, which was surprising. Um, if you want to more, know more about the details of this, uh, feel free to ask me later. OK, so we now have a robot that can apply its emotional intelligence to data and even domains it's never seen before. But is that enough? OK, so Samantha the AI said something really strange. She said, I'm composing music about what it feels to be with you on the beach right now. Wow. What does that even mean? <laughs> so to warn you, from now, it's going to get even weirder. <laughs> OK. So could robots feel? So the, the reason, I'll just motivate why I'm interested in this topic. When I was in Japan, uh, I, I played flute. Not very well, but I played flute. And when I got to Japan, I wanted to combine this robotic study with music. So we started making music playing robots. They weren't very good. You wouldn't put them in an orchestra. But we tried to make them as co-players with humans. So we developed them, and they could do really great things. They could synchronize with a human. They could recognize our gestures to start at the same time. But there was still a problem. We would show these at these conferences, and they would say, but yeah, you're, yeah your robot plays music well, but it's not a real musician. What do you mean? Well, a real musician plays with emotion to feel something and that it conveys that emotion through music to the audience. So I said, okay, so I suck, but, <laughs> but then it got me thinking, well, what does that even mean? What would it mean? What does it mean for us to feel emotion and then generate that music? And what would it mean for a robot? Could it ever feel something that would, that would generate an authentic emotional experience for an audience? So that's why I started thinking about it. I haven't quite gotten to the, the end goal yet, but the, here, let me tell you how far I got. Here's the question. Why does music move us? So I'd like to show you a clip of an eighth-month-old baby. If you Google YouTube, um, I Google YouTube, if you look on YouTube for emotional baby, you'll come up with this. Mommy's going to sing you a song. You want mommy to sing a song, honey? Let me know how you feel about the song, OK? I don't want you to come out here no more. I beg you for mercy. 
you don't know how strong my weakness is or how much it hurts me cause when you see it's over with her I want to believe it's true so I let you hear It's too much, okay? <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> don't worry, it ends nicely. She ends up, you know, at the very end, she plays the baby and the baby's all happy again. But isn't that interesting? At that such a young age, not only can, is there this emotional contagion from sound to feeling, well, actually, that's the thing. She gets the sound and makes it her feel clearly in a certain way. And I don't know about you, but there's definitely some scenes in Up, the beginning of... Um, uh, I don't know, the greatest show, like movies where you feel just from music uh, that those emotional feelings. Yeah. So the question is then, what is that feeling? <laughs> what is feeling? So one suggestion comes from Antonio Damasio. Um, he's an emotion neuroscientist at UCLA. He has a great TED talk if you're interested. He says that feelings are, well, what are, what are feelings? Okay, here's one possible definition. It says that they're the expression of human flourishing or human distress as they occur in the body and the mind. Um, so I don't know what you think, but I, this was the best thing that I could find at that time. No one, up until now, a lot of people like to model emotions for robots in a very functional way, but I, I couldn't find anyone that had tried to define feelings for robots. So that's what I, I tried to do. And here's how I proposed, uh, proposed it for my, my PhD thesis, at least. At birth, we have a distress signal. OK, it sounds something like this. Or do I have the sound? It's wah, wah, right? OK. Show something that's not right. Um, it could be that they're hungry or that they're cold. Something's wrong with their body. And otherwise, we're full and we're happy and we're in this physical flourishing state. So the idea is maybe we could define the same thing for robots, is when the robot is having a low battery or their motors are too hot and it's in a physically unwell state, that this could be distress, physical distress, and that when everything's, all systems go, this is flourishing. Okay. In the brain, so that's the body. What about the brain? In the brain, we know that there's a somatosensory cortex that evaluates and represents the body's physical state like its temperature, its viscera. And the insula, although it's still a bit mysterious, it does appear that it stores emotional associations between stimuli and this feeling, this gut feeling, physical state. So what I was proposing was that if we have, if we could represent robot feelings as follows. Um, let's see if I have a... Nene. So right now we see the robot Nene. is in a flourishing condition. Everything is totally fine with its body. Nene. The parent mirrors that. It's playing with it. It's positive. And Nene. so we make these associations with this physical Nene. positive feeling with this external Nene. input, maybe also mirrored in our mirror neurons. Nene. And we create these models in our body. Nene. Or in our brain. In our Nene. brain. Okay, may I may stop, okay. And so my hypothesis, or at least the way that I tried to implement in the robot is that maybe when we get that emotional contagion from music, we have this mirror system in our premotor cortex and we pick out that association with insula and we make that associated with the feeling that we learned when we were very young. So I don't know if that speaks to any of you, but I thought that was kind of cool, like just the idea of how we might be able to develop this in robots. And this is part of a field called developmental robotics. Um, the idea is to take input from developmental psychology and maybe use that to um, build out um, robots that learn like children. So this is what it looked like. Oh, okay. Baby. Maybe. 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 
Okay, so I'm a little bit early. I went through that ra rather quickly. Um, but here are some closing thoughts for where maybe you could go with this and apply it to your own research. Okay. Today we're building a lot of AI that works with very specific domains, which is great. We build, we train it with millions of pieces of data, and then it can recognize something that is kind of similar to what it's already seen. But I think if we want to get generality, Right? Let me see if I can, right? We're able to, we don't have a dog emotion detector, or we don't have an opera emotion detector. We don't necessarily have all these specific detectors for specific things, but somehow we can recognize and generalize to different situations we've never seen before. So if you're building this kind of AI, maybe try to think about how can it deal with even dif more different situations. The word understanding is a very loaded word that could take up an entire other lecture, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, but what we can say are, for instance, uh, do you remember the Tay incident? Microsoft Tay that learned off of the tweets on the trolls on the internet and then started saying racist slurs and um, um, misogynistic, terrible things. So that shut down really quickly. And I don't know how we could have prevented that. But um, maybe there would have been some emotional aspects. I'm not sure. But for sure, the bot did not understand the thing that it was tweeting, right? So is there a way to get at understanding? I don't know. But maybe we can still, that's still in a space that is yet to be fully explored. And I spent almost my entire PhD reading psychology papers and neuroscience papers. So maybe that's an inspiration for anybody in robotics or in cognitive science. Um, we can definitely learn from other fields. Um, and you know, neuro, the neural, neural networks, which are so prevalent today, somebody sat down and thought, huh, how do neurons work in the human brain? How does backpropagation work in the human brain? Like, that's all sorts of inspiration that didn't just pop up in computer science, it came from another field. So if we're thinking about the next type of technology, let's look at these other fields and get inspired. So we're, were we able to make an AI that could compose music based on its feelings? No. But <laughs> I think we've made some progress towards at least understanding the problem. We kind of figure out this way that emotions can kind of cross different fields, um, like movements of the waves to sound. And we thought about how a robot's physical body uh, might be able to anchor this idea of feelings in the real world. So. Um, science fiction, yeah, we're still far off, but hopefully we can, we've, we've made some progress towards there. So what's next? Well, there's all the unsolved stuff here for sure, but I'm also really interested in context. So prediction, we um, understand people's emotions a lot by what we predict um, and not necessarily what we perceive. So that's a really interesting field. Um, richer emotions, so we just talked about positive and negative. Right, maybe happiness, sadness, anger, and fear, but there's all these other emotions that 
are in our spectrum. Um, and to be honest, I'd love if psychologists could speak to this model and tell me if it has any legs on it, because this is just me coming from a computer science modeling perspective. And I don't know, um, I, I would love to have a real psychologist take on that. Um, are we really shaped by this motherese thing when we, when we first grow up or, or not? That's something that um, we, I pieced together from all these different literature, but still has yet to be maybe properly studied, probably because we don't want to be yelling at actual babies. We don't want to be like, I don't think we'll get the ethics approval to be like, stop that, stop, you know, like that's probably not something that we can get, but. Okay, so, uh, and that's, that's kind of the end of it. So I'd love, all of these things this is what we're doing in our lab. I'm trying to build robot brains to make robots useful and interact naturally. Um, trying to develop the software to help understand what humans do think, feel, and need. And what we talked about today was this third aspect, which was trying to implement models of the human mind based on neuroscience, um, psychology, and developmental science. So I think that's all that I have. Sorry to end a little bit early, but thank you very much. Do you have any questions?